Welcome, guys. Today we're here with Paul, the headhunter, I'm going to say, Buentello? Buentello, yeah, that's close Buentello. enough. Buentello. What does that mean in Spanish, you know? Uh, it's, it's, it's a more of an Italian last name. You know, somewhere my uh, grandfather back in the day got with a, got a little Italian girl somewhere. I don't know, I, I don't know how that happened, you know? <laughs> okay. Well, Paul is a heavyweight MMA fighter for the past, past I believe, 16 plus years, correct? Yeah, 16 plus years. Yeah, it's true. And, so, my first question to you, this is coming from somebody who, I mean, I play football. I like to, I like to hit hit cats. I like to hit people. Um, but never done it with my hands. Never kicked anybody in the face. Never submitted anybody. What I mean, you have over nineteen or twenty knockouts. Right? Yeah. I mean, yep. what, does that, what does that feel like? Is it like? Can, can you like illustrate that for us when you <laughs> knock <laughs> somebody <laughs> out? Yeah, you know, you know, getting a knockout, it's like, a, you know, if anybody can relate to like hitting a home run, you really don't feel it. You know, you just, uh, it's really, it's really smooth feeling. You, you don't feel any pressure. It's, it's almost hitting the ball on the sweet spot. You know, you just hit somebody on the button and, and down they go. You really don't realize that they're out until, you know, I've been fighting for a while. So the referee pulls you off every now and then you'll get that shot and you hit the guy and he drops and then you know, you can, you, you know it was a clean shot. It, it, it's very, it, it feels very comfortable. It's not, it's nothing like, wow, I just hit him really hard or you, you know, you feel bones crush underneath your fingers or your, your hand is, it's a real, it, it's, 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 it's like a natural feeling. It's kind of, I've been doing it for so long. So I, you can't really, I can't really try to describe it. it just, it's, it's just, it just feels so natural. I've been doing it for a while. Okay. Now let's, let's start from the beginning. You're a Amarillo, Texas man, aren't you? Yeah, from Texas, definitely. What What was it like growing up? Ooh, I mean, what What was your environment, your neighborhood like? What was that like? You know, it's it was more of a country. You know, I, I grew up. My first town was uh, Tulia, which was like 40, 60 miles south of Amarillo, small town in country boy feeling. Everybody knew everybody. And then when I moved up to Amarillo, that's when I went into the uh, fifth grade. I was in Amarillo in my fifth grade on up to high school. Real relaxed, nothing crazy, you know, wasn't really uh, getting picked on or, you know, no bullying and stuff like it is now. But I've always had, always had that urge to, you know, I was always an aggressive kid, even in, even in, um, in Tulia, all the way growing up. I was just, just an aggressive kid. Okay. Uh, let's jump to the obvious question. When did you start fighting? <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> when I started fighting, it was back in 96, 1996. Uh, it was, uh, I was working, you know, I was working at a bar, you know, I was doing, I was doing Taekwondo right out of high school. When I was growing up in, in, in Tulia, I did a little golden gloves boxing and till I was, I was from five to all eight years old. Then I moved up to Amarillo, never got really involved in, in anything, anything else. You know, I played baseball, I played football, you know, baseball was my sport. That's the sport that I really wanted to fulfill. And it just didn't come out that way. When I was in uh, in high school, right out of high school, right when I graduated high school, I got involved in Taekwondo and and you know started doing the martial arts thing. And then one day, uh, I was I was working at I was working security at a, at a at a club, a little you know country club, and I saw this uh, this fight, the UFC. I think it was UFC two, or UFC one on on VHS on a VHS uh, videotape. And I was like, man, I want to do that. I want to try that. I mean, because back then when the UFC first started, it was all on on VHSs. It wasn't on DVDs or, you know, downloads or anything else. It was like this little black tape that everybody would just keep passing around. It wasn't on TV. And I said, man, I want to try that. And before you know it, in Amarillo, Texas, there were, there were some fights. They called it Pancration style, basically shoot fighting, which was an open hand Open hand strikes, so basically slapping each other. But if you learn how to really hit with your with your palm or your hand, you, it, it really hurts. And they Texas had it legalized where you couldn't use a closed fist. But uh, the promoter back then, uh, Steve Nelson, had a couple of shows. Had one show, and you know the roar of the crowd. And I was like, wow, I really want to do this. And like, and then the very next show, which is like three months later, I got I jumped right in there, wanted to do it. And I got paid 500 bucks. And the thing back then, it was 500 bucks to win and a dollar to lose. 
So he had to pay you something. So if you lose, you got a dollar. If you won, you got you got five hundred. And it was pretty interesting that somebody was going to pay me five hundred bucks to fight some other guy. Yeah. And one thing led to another, and I thought that's when I wanted to be in the UFC. I wanted to try for it. And here we go. You know, it took me eight years to get in the UFC. Now, how did you? I mean, what inspired you? Was it just, did you, I mean, was it just a challenge of fighting? Was it because you wanted to prove yourself? What, what challenged you to do? Uh, you know, the, the UFC challenge. Is it, I'm sorry, UFC wasn't what it is today, obviously. No. It wasn't no. a, a worldwide brand. So, like, what inspired you to say, hey, you know, I want to do that? Just, just to test myself, to see how far I could push myself. And back then, people would tell me, oh, you can't do it. There's no way you're going to make it there. There's no way, you know, blah, 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 coming out of Amarillo, Texas. And and I wanted to prove everybody wrong. Just them telling me that I couldn't do it, just wanted me to do it even more. So, I mean, what was training like? <laughs> At the very first, the very first training camp I had was uh, I belled hay. If you don't know what belling hay is, it, what it is is that you, you know, after the field, they cut the hay and then they bell it. They make bells of hay. Well, you, you get paid 50 cents a bell if you load it up on the trailer, and then you load it on the trailer, then you take it to where whoever bought the hay, and you unload it, and you stack it in their barn. Now, keep in mind, you, you can see a normal trailer. Trailer's probably about two feet off the ground, and you have to stack. Each bale is about two foot high by four foot long, and you have to stack six to seven high. So, wow. so and what we'll do, since you know I was, I was going to fight in a couple of weeks, so me and my buddy would be like, okay, let's just put the truck, let's just put the truck in drive. We'll run next to the truck and keep stacking hay. So for two weeks, we we're just, we we're just belling hay, just, just trying to, you know, make some money and get the training in at the same time. And that was basically my training camp was, uh, belling hay for two weeks. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just soaking that in that you, you train. For a fight against another heavyweight man, correct? Yeah, well, another guy. He had more experience than I did. Uh, he's he, he, at that time he had more experience than I did. His name was uh, James Stone. It's actually that fight is not on my record for some reason. I have no idea why it's not on my record, but uh, uh it's yeah. So I, I basically belling hay, running around belling hay, and not not boxing, not hitting the bags, not not grappling, nothing, just. Belling hay, it's it's so funny to, to hear that I was just belling well, hay. Well, let's, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to be real. Like, you went into a fight against another man training by bailing hay. Did you, <laughs> have any, did you have any doubt? I mean, obviously, people back then had their doubts, uh, just in general, it sounds like. Did you have any doubt that, like, you were going to walk in there, walk into, was it an octagon back then? Or was it no, it, it, was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a boxing ring. It was a, basically okay. a boxing ring, yeah. Did you did you have any self doubt or were you like you know what it's the closest thing I it's the best I can do? No, he's gonna, he's no. Gonna suffer either way. You, you got to think. You got to think of back then, growing up in a small town, is like hey, this is a, uh, this is this is, I can do this. You because all it was back then. Let's just be real. I'm gonna be per blank. It's just either you got the balls to do it or you don't. Exactly. And I did, and that that was that was the whole thing. Is like. I got the balls to do it, and and I was like, you know, I'm going to do this. No, no problem at all. Okay, so how how's your first couple of fights go? I mean, did you win this? Uh, fight? I mean, oh yeah, I won that fight, and I, I won that fight. I was like, hey, I can do this, you know. I got paid 500 bucks <laughs> to do this, and got my hands raised, and totally, 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 totally excited. So I was like, I want to do this again. I want to do this again. And my first three fights, my first three fights, I, I won. I won by in the first round. You know, I first fight, I knocked, the first fight, I, I knocked the guy out in the, in the first round. The second guy knocked him out in like 15 seconds. And then I got into a tournament. I won the first two fights under a minute. And then I, then I, I think after my fourth fight, then my fifth fight, I fought another local favorite that actually uh, became a UFC champion in the uh, middleweight division, uh, Evan Tanner. That was, he was my first fight that I lost, but. You know, the motivation from that was, wow, I can keep doing this. You know, it, this is, this is fun. So did you have, let me, let me, let me, let me pause here. Did you have any, 
like role model role models, excuse me, or you, mentors you, that were yeah, sport you, specific? No, you know that that's the that's I, I I try to think about it that I looked up towards somebody and or I I sit there and go oh I want to be just like him. No, it it was never that. It was it was all self motivated that I got myself to where I, I you know got myself through fighting just just the way I was. Uh, it's you know I never looked up you know about that time uh, Frank Shamrock was huge. Uh, Ken Shamrock, Dan Severn, Dan Severn was huge, but I never really looked up. I never had like an idol, as you would say, and and go, that's who I want to be, or that's how I want to follow their footsteps. So it was, it was my self motivation and myself uh, trying to prove everybody wrong or, that I could do something. Um, I, I, now I'm at, I'm going a little bit deeper because I just I think that there's a lot of people out there that. Are, it seems not weird, but like, like, wait, how did you do that? How did you, like, first of all, you're jumping into this new UFC Ultimate Fighting thing. You don't really follow any of the people who are big, but like, you're obviously like taking names when you're in the in the ring. Like, how did you motivate yourself? Like, what, what did you tell? Did you watch Rocky? You know what I'm thinking? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just yeah, saying, no, like, you, know, you, you got a good point. You know, I never really thought of it that way. Um, but yeah, I, I I didn't I didn't look at you know my motivation was people always telling me I couldn't do it. Okay. You, uh, you know that I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Oh, you you're never going to mount it. Oh, you're still doing that fighting stuff. How far how far are you going to go with it? And all those people are telling me I can't do something with myself, and I I'm never going to fulfill my dream. And that's the way I set myself is that I set myself as you know I'm going to make it to the UFC. Uh, I'm not going to go in there and win big or you know i just want to be invited to the ufc i want to make it to the show make it to the big show and just compete just give it all i got and with that motivation that i did with, with telling myself you know it doesn't matter what everybody's telling me i'm going to do this and i did it and the funny thing is is that i got my first fight in the ufc it took me eight years to get there you know bump roads after bumps roadblocks after roadblocks i mean just you name it i dealt with it but I still, I still kept moving forward and moving forward, moving forward and jump over this hill, jump over that fence, do this, do that. Oh, it was, it, it was, it was a long, long treacherous road. It was really long, really hard. You know, a lot of ups and downs, a lot, a lot more downs than there were ups. But as soon as I got invited to the UFC, I went to the, and the, and the funny thing is that I got invited to UFC 50. You know, we're already in UFC 60. So that's already 110 shows ago. UFC 50, I was invited to and, and when they called me, they wanted me to fight, and I was like, "No, nah, I can't do it right now. I got too much stuff going on in my life. I, I, I can't do it." And there, and the funny thing is, you know, Dana White was like, "You're, you're turning down a UFC shot." I go, "Yeah, I'm turning it down because I'm not ready. I just feel that I'm not ready." And he respected that—that that I was honest and I didn't want to jump in, jump into the show with so much issues going on. So I didn't do that fight, but they brought me in for UFC 51. So I went in and fought UFC 51 against Justin Eilers, and I got a great knockout in the first round. Knocked him out. I got got my hands raised, and it was a good feeling. You know, I made it to the UFC. I fought UFC 51. I got my hands raised. I got knocked out of the night. Man, I was on cloud nine. Yeah, yeah. And 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 I just it was just one of those things that I just kept on. That's when I proved everybody that I can do it, and I just stayed with it. Okay. I mean, that, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you, you, you stated earlier that you've been, you've been fighting the bad for over 16 years. What's changed? Um, has anything really changed for you as far as preparation and, um, dare I say, like maintenance of your motivation? Like, uh, oh. you're a seasoned fighter. What, what's changed for you? Well, a lot's changed. Uh, you know, I've, I, I'm, still, I'm still competing. I mean, you know, I've, I've been in the UFC again. I went back to the UFC. I fought. I fought for a lot of major shows. Um, I did. I did run into a roadblock to where <clears throat> did run into a mental state to where I wasn't motivated and you know got into that depression mode, and that was a hard part. That was two years ago, but I you know I realized that I was I was uh, not right and went talk got got help, and that was probably the hardest part was that I got help and I feel better and you know it just seems. Seems like my career is back on track a little bit. I'm I'm coming off of three good wins, three good knockouts, <clears throat> and you know I'm working. You know the UFC is like a uh, is like the show. It's like Major League Baseball, and 
you, you, right now I'm in the minor leagues and, and I'm right there. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, one base hit away, then get back into the show. Okay. Um, now you, you said that you, you were, you had to get help for your depression or your depressed state. What did you see yourself just hanging them up? Like, did you? Um, no, no, it wasn't more hanging them up. It's just, um, you know, that was, that, that was way on the back burner, but wasn't hanging it. It was more like, um, what, what more do I want to, I mean, do it, it, it was, it was, I was at that point to where I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know where I wanted to go. And I wasn't motivated to train, you know, my, my, my body wanted to train, you know, my mind it just didn't want to do anything. And that was the hard part is, was trying to convince myself that something was wrong, that I, I needed to talk to somebody, I needed to do something and, and get better and get better with, with, uh, motivating myself to start training again. You know, I, and what, what got it, you know, I got, I got the little bit of help. I talked to a doctor and, and everything, you know, let's say hey, when they tell you it's, it's not you, it's just the chemical imbalance, you know, it's just your body's changing a little bit and you just get a chemical imbalance and you just have to put your balance in your head back together, you know, you have to take some pills and, and feel better. And that's what I did. I, I literally asked for help and got better. And, and then my motivation started coming back because <clears throat> getting released from the UFC last, you know, a year and a half ago, I got released. And the, at that point, that's, that's when those people were coming. Oh, you know, you, you should quit fighting. You know, there's no way you can compete. There's no way you can get back in the UFC, blah, blah, blah. And then that started putting a fire underneath my ass to, uh, to, to, to make a run for it again. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so tell us about your last couple of fights. That, you said that was a year and a half, year and a half ago? Yes. I, uh, don't, don't have, I don't have the exact date in front of me, but yeah, so I've been, um, so I fought three, five, I fought four fights, three fights. And the whole thing about the UFC is that they'll take you back if you're on a winning record. So right now I've, I've got three good fights right now. First two fights were knockouts. This last fight was a decision, but, you know, if I would have had a little extra, maybe another minute, I would have knocked the guy out. Uh, my last two fights were in Russia. So, you know, fortunate enough that I do have a name and, and, and I got promoters calling and asking for me to fight and, you know, I'm getting offers left and right, but just picking out the right fight and getting the W. And that's what's so crazy about this sport is that most of these guys that, that make it to the UFC so fast and they're, they're in that, they're in that realm, but they just don't, they just don't make it or they, they get the name or they get the recognition from the UFC. Then they get released from the UFC and they have no options. They have no options if they want to keep fighting because they don't have that name or that recognition to, uh, for promoters to go, Hey, I want them on my fight card or I want to give them a chance or he's exciting. It, it, it's, it's a rough sport right now. It's because it's too small. UFC controls a lot of, you know, controls the whole realm of the sport. It is the show. It is the place to be. But when you come out of the UFC, it's really fine. It's really hard to find work if you don't have that name. Well, that, and, and that, that actually opens up a, uh, a door that I want to ask about. Because I, I mean, I, I love boxing. I like watching uh, MMA, all types of fighting. You talked, you talked about picking your fights and, and promoters. Like, can you explain to us what that means? I mean, we hear we hear you know Teddy Atlas and Max Kellerman talking about stuff. You know, we hear we hear Joe Rogan talking. I mean, what 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 is it like when you're not the guy? When you're not the hot guy? What, like you're talking about, you just explained how if you don't have a name, you know, they don't know what to do. But what is it like just creating work for yourself and picking fights, picking good opponents, picking good promoters? How how hard is that? Oh, it's very hard. You, you, it's very hard. It's extreme. It's, it's hard for me to sense to where I might have a, I might have a month or two months of, of nothing really going on. But then once they, once, once they start calling, because it's like a season, it's like almost like harvest season when it comes to fighting, you know, either they want it during the summer or they, you know, they, there's not really, cause the winter time, there's not really that many places you can't fight unless they have indoor, indoor areas. And just the cop, you know, I, you know, it's, it's weird that, there's like a fighting season. You know, there's not much fighting in the wintertime, but once spring and, and January and spring starts coming around, they want, you know, there's, there's fights popping up everywhere. Um, 
when you don't have the name, when you don't have the name or the recognition or the or the you know, basically, if you don't, if you're not a veteran in the sport, it's hard to find fights. But if they if they recognize you and know that you you are a veteran, which most some promoters look at you and they go, oh, this is Paul Buentello. Oh, he's fought he's fought the number one contention for this. He fought for this. He's fought for that. Well. I want him on my show. I want to see if he can, how can my number one star do against him? And, and basically you have to realize that, you know, right now I'm, I'm pretty much, I could be a stepping stone if I pick the wrong fight. You know, I don't want to go against, I don't want to go against a guy that's, that's, uh, you know, world class jujitsu guy or, or I don't want to go against a guy that's, you know, has 30, 30 knockouts coming out of K1 kickboxing. You, you 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 understand you you don't yeah. want to you don't want to go against the you don't want to go into the major leagues and and uh, first of all you go off against you, you go against Nolan Ryan for your first round of bats. No sir. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so you, you got to pick you got to pick the right lanes and and find the right fights and you know having having my my you know experience in my long range of of being in, in the sport for a while and, and having a lot of connections you know I, I get a chance to pick those fights. But there's times that there's been a couple of times I don't have that option to pick fights. Like right now, this one fight keeps popping up left and right. And th- these guys want me to fight him so bad. His name is uh, Alexander Elaminko, which is that's uh, Fedor's little brother, Fedor Elaminko. Okay. Okay. And he's tough. Don't get me wrong. He's tough, which it's, it's a great fight. It's an awesome fight. And I, I, I would take the fight. You know, we were supposed to fight back in, I would believe, 2009, 2010, we were supposed to fight, and he did a blood test. He didn't pass his blood test. So, you know, he has hepatitis C. And I keep telling these promoters, uh, there's, I mean, it, there's, there's too much of a risk for me to, to fight him. And when he has hepatitis C, oh, no, he's good, he's good, he can pass this, he can pass that. But I don't want to take that. You know, that, that yeah, yeah. I, I, I swear, in the last two months, that fight's come across my desk Three times already. Actually, it came across my desk two nights ago, asking if I would fight him July fourth, and I'm like, no, there's just uh, you know, there's there's no way, there's no way I'm fighting. There's there's no way to guarantee my safety in that fight. So essentially, and you do all this by yourself. You don't have. I, you know, I, I I used to have a manager, but I realized that I realized that you know having a manager. It's just I'm basically giving money away to somebody that I, I know the sport. I've been involved in the sport. I know the lingo. I know who to talk to. It's kind of hard to sell myself. It, you know, it really is hard to sell yourself to somebody. But if they're calling me, they already want me. So it's not a sale. I just have to just – I just have to be – how would you say it? I just have to be a good salesman and, and be aggressive on the pay and on the contract. Uh, I had an offer. I had an offer a couple of months ago from uh, M1, M1, M1 Global, which is a big MMA sport in in Russia, and they're they're all over Poland. They're they're pretty much they're pretty big, but they're they're like used car salesmen on the, on the money. They just want to just nickel and dime you to death. And we agreed on some money. And the thing is, when I get their contract, their contract is for six fights and for you know two and a half years. Uh, no, you know, exclusive, can't go anywhere, can't fight for anybody else, and they have con- full control of you for three years. This is it was just way too much, too much holding and too much control. And I sent them my back. There's no way I'm going to do this. You know, they're pretty upset, but I'm I'm not going to get involved with the company that's going to hold me down for five years. You know, let's let's face it. Uh, I have two more years, or maybe you know, one year of fighting left, and I want to give it all I got. I don't want to be tied down to a to a five year contract. So you, the other thought of you basically handling your your brand, I mean, that's it's your brand. Yeah. You, the other thought of it is um, the business side, whether it's promotions or endorsements or, or uh, charities. How do, you, how do you do that? How, how do you handle that so far? Uh, you know, I, I've, I've got, I've got it. I got one agent. His name is uh, Brian, Brian Yoshin, uh, Yoshida. He handles a lot of that stuff, you know, doing appearances and, and stuff like that. But there's nothing. That's that's probably the that's probably the hardest part is to sell myself to be in a to, to make an appearance. The harder the easy part is selling myself to go fight. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. I, I can see that being being treacherous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, uh, are you a good speaker? Do you, you know, do you, do you know your manners? Yes, you know, it, it's. 
the, the whole part of why I got to, why do I got to come to a function and get paid for the appearance, you know, to, to sell myself that way is probably harder to do than, Hey, I can fight anybody. You know, I, it, it's easier to sell myself as a fighter than to sell myself as a celebrity, I guess you could say. Understandable. Um, so you said you have maybe one, maybe two years left. What's, what are you going to do after that? What, what's on the horizon? Are you just, you, you know, I, 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 I right do now? that. I've been working on, I got a lot of stuff in, I got a lot of, a lot of irons in the, in the fire right now. I'm working on, working on one day trying to get my uh, defensive tactics for police officers off and running. Uh, and that's one thing that's, that could be real profitable if I can just get the, just get it off and, you know, I've, I got to build the website, you know, just all those little nick things. And I went and got certified by, um, by Texas Officer Association to teach officers. It's called Cheat Close. And what that is, it's a certification to teach officers the right. Yeah, you have to learn how to teach officers in the manner that the state wants you to teach their officers. So I got certified in that last what, two years ago. So that that's a plus. That's probably the hardest thing to do because that was classes every other day for what was that six weeks or something. And luckily, I had a good friend in the in the police in the police uh, department that got me in that course, which it's pretty much almost like a $10,000 course, and he got me in there for $50. So I had to jump in that. Yeah. And I, yeah. I, right now I'm, I'm doing this whole uh, – I'm going back and forth with this other guy that has a, uh, a defensive tactic program pretty much in set, but he can't sell it because he doesn't have the experience as a combative. It, it, you know, and the way the brass looks at it is that, yeah, yes, he, you know, he has 22 years in, in the police, police force, but he doesn't have combative – experience and that's one thing that we're trying to you know work out the deals and talk out the percentages but the thing is to get my program written down in the in let's say the brass lingo the corporate lingo to where they can understand it to to where the upper class which you gotta think that that brass and those lieutenants and those and those captains you know they're 50 50 to 50 to 60 to 70 years old they don't understand me coming in as a professional fighter with a combative experience, how's that going to help their law enforcement? That's how they're going to help their department be aware of the situation that's happening on the streets. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes that makes sense. That makes sense. I mean, that's that's cool. This whole show is about. I mean, it's about a lot of things. It's about sports and business, but it's also about the business goals and ventures of the guests of the athletes on the show. Yep. And how for me hearing that that's. I mean that's awesome. Hey, did you did you ever want to be a cop, or is it something where you just realized, hey, you know what? I know how to I know how to make dudes submit. Why can't I just teach <laughs> teach guys well, to do it for a living to do it? Well, you know, I never really really wanted to be a cop, but having two good friends that are police officers and having family members that that are, are police officers and and seeing and seeing how 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 evolved the sports coming, and they're dealing they're dealing with these with these with these subjects let's say these these people these kids that are coming out of hooters or coming out of these buffalo wild wings that just got through watching these fights and now they think they can do it well if you look at the police if you, and i've been to you know uh police departments where they're training their cadets and they have their 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 little boot camps and stuff and their their defensive tactics is is all you know back then you know straightforward karate and it just doesn't work anymore. You know, these cops have no idea that these kids that are 16, 17, even, you know, 25, 30 years old, because the demographics of the age of this sport is from, is from 15 to 35. But now between, and between that, between 18 to 35, how many of those kids, how many of those people or those men are in, are in bars and drinking and watching these fights at Hooters and Buffalo Wild Wings? And then they come out with a little chip on their soldier. Oh, I can do. I'm an MMA fighter. I can do this. And police officers in the way, and they have a little little alcohol. They're going to shoot in and try to take the cop down. What? And the cop. Either way you look at it, the police officer shows up to the situation, not understanding that they just got done watching an MMA fight, not understanding that, that you know to be aware that there is a UFC fight on TV, that to be aware that these locations are showing the show. And that's the whole thing about this program is that. We're trying to develop an app. I'm, this is my whole thing is develop an app to where when you come into my program, you come in as, as a student, you come out as an instructor, but you also get updates and people, and these officers sign up for an app to where, hey, tonight's a, tonight's a fight. You'll see 167. These are the locations where these are going to be sold. 
in your in your city. So you know, just be aware, kind of give them an update, because these guys, because when a cop shows up to a location, it can just be a domestic talk about little you know push and shove. But when an officer shows up, he puts a gun into the situation. So it becomes a gun involved in situation. When any time a police officer shows up, even though there's not a weapon involved, it becomes a critical when because a, a cop shows up with the weapon. So everything changes when a guy is going to shoot for the legs and take an officer down. First thing officer has to do, you know, how to sprawl, how to get back up, how to protect his weapon. It, it just goes on and on and on. Yeah, I mean, that's... I, I never even thought about that, that angle of it, and I think that's a... That is a brilliant business idea that you definitely need to jump on immediately. <laughs> you definitely need to jump on that immediately. Yeah, eh... It's 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 weird because I I've done ride alongs with my with a good friend of mine in Midland Texas, which is not a big city, but you know it, the crime is the crime wave is up and down because of the oil business, and just going with him and riding those cars, you're talking about your heart just jumps up 60, 70 beats just because we pull up to a location, and I didn't realize this until he the one that pointed out to me this could just be a a normal disturbance, just a a neighbor versus neighbor, just you know talking loud to each other. When I show up, it brings a gun onto the situation. And I go, wow. You know, he goes, it could just be something simple. And the, one of the neighbors could see my gun and go, hey, you know what? I'm going to get my, this guy's gun and I'm going to kill everybody. So it's, yeah. it, it, and you have to be ready. You never know. One of those neighbors could just got done watching, had a party at his house, watching the UFC and got a chip on his shoulder and start arguing with his neighbor. And now he wants to be an MMA fighter. And that's one of the things that, that we're, I'm trying to include in, in this system is it's called the uh, MIST, uh, MMA Influence Subject. It's MIS because all these cops like acronyms on everything, so you have to put acronyms <laughs> on everything. You know, it, it, it's going to be fun, but it's going to take time because it's not. I can understand it, and anybody my age down can understand it. But it's the top brass. It's the it's the mayor. It's the it's the city councilor. It's the state of Texas. We have to look at this program and go, oh, it makes sense. Again, that's a brilliant, brilliant business. Well, not just a I don't want to say a business idea to just make it seem heartless, but it's a, um, I think it's a necessary shift that needs to be brought into it because, I mean, for me, it's like you see a cop, whether it's out on the street on patrol or whatever, but you just, you just tend to forget that, yeah, he has a gun. It's no longer, you know, you know. And mano y mano, it's no, it's no longer just two men. No, it's two not. Men and a deadly weapon. You know, we forget that. Yeah, it, it, he brings a weapon into the, into any situation. Uh, it's you know, and it's one of those things where I can, you know, I have the experience, and and it's funny that when you have the experience, like I've I've have it since I started fight, I haven't been into a street altercation for a long time. I mean, it's been a while since I got into a street fight or a bar fight. Long, long time. And I always stop it. I always stop it. The last time was probably, man, I don't know how long ago. But, you know, a guy was being, you know, pushy and wanted to confront me. And I go, hey, calm down. Wait a minute. You know, let's, let's talk about this. No, no, I'm going to kick your ass. I'm going to do this. Wait, wait, wait. What do you, what do you do for a living? He goes, I'm a plumber. I mean, I'm a construction worker. I forgot what he said. I'm like, okay, that's great. That's cool. I bet you're, you're good at your work. He goes, yeah, I'm great at it. He goes, wow, what do you do? I said, I fight professionally. And he sits there and thinks about it. He's like, you know, I could be good or I could be bad at my job. You know, do you want to keep going forward? And, and they, they, it kind of makes them think, well, if, I, if I'm good at my job, he must be good at his job. And one story, I mean, it, 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 this is pretty much close. To, I mean, this has happened a while back, but a long, long time ago, this really happened in a bar. A guy was really being confronted. I said, hey, well, and he goes, I fight for a living. He goes, yeah, whatever. And, and, and I said, look over your shoulder. There's a poster. There was a fight poster on the wall. And he looks over, and I go, that's me. And he goes, that is you. Go, All right. And, <laughs> You want to keep, you know, he goes, we cool. I mean, do you want to keep doing this? He goes, no, no, man, I'm cool. I'm cool. I'm cool. I said, all right. You know, he goes, is that really you? I go, yeah, that's me. <laughs> true freaking story. I just remember that that really happened in a bar and the guy was just kept on and kept on. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, I, you know, you're a plumber. I'm a fighter. You know, yeah, right. You ain't no fighter. I go, well, that's me on the poster right there. And, yeah. you know, this whole demeanor changes. Yeah, that. Yeah, that might be the moment where you say to yourself, whoa, I need to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. 
Well, Paul, man, it's been great having you on here. Where can we find you online? Where can we find you? Right, right now, I mean, if anybody's out there, you know, that listens to this, I am looking for some help on the re, to find, to redo my website. My website was, was probably the best online. It was really interactive. And I really, I lost control of it the last, probably the last year or so. Uh, basically, you can find me on Facebook, Paul Buentello on Facebook, but the, the fan page I do have is Paul the Headhunter Buentello, which I do need more followers on there. And when it starts transferring everything over to the fan page, but if anybody's out there and want to really help me out on my website, I have a simple new idea how I want to, how to want to set my website to where it's still interactive and easy to, uh, to navigate. Definitely hit me up on, on Facebook or, uh, any of those pages right there, or even there's is a contact page on my website that I still I still get all the emails from. Um, I'm pretty easy to get a hold of on the on the net, but uh, I'm always around. Okay, and then last the last piece of our show is obviously you know we have different members of the audience uh, listening. People like me, I mean I listen to this three or four times. I mean, we got we got people who are avoiding work listening to this. We have younger kids, boys and girls listening to this. Um, we have people in college. What one piece of advice can you share with us to help us get closer to our goals? I mean, I'll take us back to the beginning of the interview. You, you saw, I mean, I'm old enough to know what a VHS is, okay? But yes. you saw a UFC on VHS and you said, I want in. I want to be a part of that. How, like, one piece of advice that you can share with us so that we can get that much closer to where we are. I'm sorry, where we want to be. Sorry. Yeah, where we want to be. You know, there's, there's, there's a couple things I could, I could, I could say that I, I, I pretty much, one thing I do really live by is that I always make, instead of making a goal, everybody has a goal. I mean, everybody has a dream. The dream is a big thing. The big thing is, 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 uh, the, where you want to be in life, but you have to put small goals in front of you. And I made my dream. My dream was to be in the UFC, was to fight in the UFC, but I didn't make it difficult. I didn't make it, I wanted to be the UFC champion. I didn't make it to where, you know, to be, to, to win and, and knock everybody out and just dominate the UFC. No, I made it pretty simple was just to be invited. Win or lose, I was going to step in that cage and fight for the UFC. That was, I didn't put too many standards on it. I didn't put goal. I didn't put something that was just ridiculous to grab. I just made it simple enough to where if I do get there, I made my dream. And between those things, I never, I always loved myself first. And when somebody tells me I can't do it, it motivated me more. Yeah. And it, it, it's funny how people always tell me why, why, why certain things doesn't bother you. Well, because it's just words. It's just people talking. I know who I am and I love myself and I like myself. I know who I am. It's not going to bother me. And just stay, just, just keep liking yourself. Keep loving yourself. It doesn't matter what about says. Just use that to motivate you. Well, you know, the, after, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. And the, you know, the main thing, the one thing I heard a while back was, uh, a man can never punch you harder than what life can. Ooh, that's deep. That's deep. <laughs> Ooh, say, say that one more time again. <laughs> a man can never punch you as hard as life can punch you. Wow, that's awesome. Write it down right now. Wow. Yeah. There's always roadblocks, but you just got to keep moving forward. But that's right. I mean, nobody can hurt you. Just life. You just got to live with it. That's awesome. Paul, I want to thank you again. After we get off the call here, I want to talk to you about a couple things, man. But I just, I appreciate you just bringing it, man. That's this is an awesome, awesome interview. Yeah. Well, I can talk all day. Just if you want to do another one, we'll do it. Hey, right, I'm a hold to that. Yeah, well, I got, when, I, when's your next fight? Uh, right now, I'm working out some deals. I'm actually. Uh, what's kind of funny is that um, I do have some promoters. You know, I got, I got I got tons of stories, tons of stories, Dave. I got. But one story is that a promoter. You know, I got like there's like three or four promoters that haven't that you know kind of jipped me on my pay, and I'm actually suing one. I'm suing one. I filed papers. I'm you know doing a small claims court. Blah blah blah. And I got contacted by Judge, Judge Mathis to uh, go on their show, but I mean, we're still going back and forth, so it'd be pretty interesting. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I, I had to turn down one fight because I'm kind of waiting to if uh, Judge Mathis is going to let me on their show or or what's going to happen on that. I thought it was pretty cool when I saw the letter from Judge Mathis. I was, man, what did I do now? What what, what is going? <laughs> but it actually to my benefit, so I was kind of excited about it. Well, cool, cool. I mean, we, we, de I think we have to do this again because we need, we need more fighters on air. We need more fighters. We need more, more men fighting men on air. <laughs> man, uh, like my girlfriend says, be a manly man, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Paul. I appreciate it, man. We'll be in touch. And.
Thanks for doing the interview. No problem. Thanks. All right.